Um, welcome everybody to this 15th Talking Crystal Growth and Design webinar. It's amazing how the time's flown. Um, we've been enjoying them very much. Uh, as a reminder, this is a monthly series showcasing some of the most innovative researchers in our field uh, and keeping us going through what was initially locked down and now uh, as we all work in our various parts of the world. Uh, my name is Jonathan Steed. Um, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Crystal Growth and Design. I'm joined by my co-host, Len Barber of Stellenbosch University. Uh, many thanks to the American Chemical Society for supporting this series, uh, particularly our ACS Marketing Manager, Kristin Call, and Managing Editor, Sonia Crane, for making it happen. So just as a, a, an advert, you can see on the screen there, next month on the 17th of May, same time, we've got Susan Motz Leedens um, from the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. She's gonna be talking about inspiring medicines through solid state chemistry. And I'll put the link uh, to sign up for her webinar in, in the chat um, once we start. Uh, but the main event today is Professor Francisca Emmerling, uh, head of the Department of Materials Chemistry at the Federal Institute for Materials Research and Testing in Berlin, in Germany. Uh, so Francisca studied chemistry at Albert Ludwig University and completed her PhD at that same institution in 2003. Her doctoral work focused on intermetallic phases and ternary oxides in unusual valence states. Uh, she did a postdoc in the group of Professor Claudia Felser at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. And in 2005, she moved to her current institution in Berlin as head of the working group on X-ray structure analysis. From 2010 to 13, she held a guest professorship in inorganic chemistry at the Humboldt University, also in Berlin. She achieved a habilitation in chemistry in 2018, focusing on in situ analysis of mechanochemical reactions. And really, um, for the last 15 years or so, she's been carrying out research on in situ um, investigations of crystallization processes, nanoparticle formation, and particularly mechanochemistry, which is her topic today. So as usual, please feel free to post questions for Francesca in the Q&A, not the chat, in the Q&A section, and then we'll read those out to Francesca at the end and hopefully have a, another lively discussion like we often do. Uh, we're recording the webinar uh, and the recording will be available afterwards if, if you drop out or, or don't have time to, to um, attend all of it. And the recordings are available through the sign up uh, page um, as, long as, the, as well as the previous um, recordings of previous talks. So without further ado then, uh, Francisca, let me invite you to give your webinar, Mechanochemistry and Co-Crystals, a never-ending story. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, John, for the introduction. Um, I will share my slides. Let me see whether that works. It looks okay for me? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot for, uh, for the invitation. As you can see from the title, I will talk about mechanochemistry and co-crystals. And when I got the invitation, I also thought a bit about my relationship to crystal growth and design. And you will see that also some aspects of my work with crystal growth and design will appear. So, but quickly, um, where do I work? That is the Federal Institute for Materials Research and Testing. It's located in Berlin. And you can see here, it's German, but nevertheless, we had just had our 150 years anniversary last year. The Institute was founded by Adolf Martens, you can see here below, and you might remember from Martens Citic Transitions as the Prussian Royal Mechanic, um, Mechanical and Technical Research Institute. So, but we have also different locations throughout Berlin, and you can see here that is the oh, I should have the pointer. That is the area where I work. That is the campus Atlas Hope, is one of the largest science um, campuses in in Germany. And as you can see here above, we have a synchrotron close by, which is in, important for for my work with the in situ studies. So as I said, um, I want to dedicate it a bit to my work with crystal growth and design. And my first publication you can see here is from 2010. And it was a special issue um, for the celebration of the 40th anniversary and uh, for, of the um, British um, Association for Crystal Growth. And the conference was held in Bristol and later on we published this uh, first article. And I just checked. So in the last years, many more um, appeared you can see just a selection here um, in the new design now. And um, yeah, many of um, my investigations focus on in situ uh, observation of crystallization processes, as John said. And you can see here one of our gimmicks. It's a so-called acoustic levitator. We can levitate um, solutions and then watch uh, crystallization appear. But also other topics um, 
were covered and appeared in crystal growth and design. And many of these work were only possible um, with strong collaborators all over the world, but especially also Europe. And you can see here two cost actions named in, at the bottom um, where we especially worked together. And that is the crystallized cost action led by um, Simon Lawrence and the mechanochemistry cost action, which is still ongoing, led by Evelina Colacchino from the University of Montpellier. Meanwhile, you can see Roy made it, it crystallized, and I can show you the aspects um, that we usually or I usually work with. So you can see different flavors um, of um, in situ methods, but also, of course, mechanochemistry. We focus on coordination polymers and MOFs and um, those uh, for, let's say, um, application in the field of energy storage. And we do um, a lot of work in the field of co-crystals and also polymorphism. But let's start with um, mechanochemistry. I'm, I'm sure that this is not a new um, issue to most of, of the listeners, but uh, just for those who haven't heard of it, it's maybe the oldest technique that humankind has used. And you can see from these first trials here up to um, usage in um, pharmacy, but also in mining. Mechanochemistry has really been around longer than any other techniques. If you think about first combustion, it was actually done by um, percussion and friction. It took some time to be recognized in the literature. And here you can see a famous textbook by Oswald. He um, subdivided the different flavors of chemistry um, according to the input energy. And he was the first one to really name mechanochemistry as an individual field along with other branches like photochemistry. So in the mid of the 20th century, uh, there were active areas in the former GDR and also in the former USSR. Interestingly enough, one of the colleagues um, from the former GDR exactly worked in Adlershof on the topic of um, mechanochemistry. Yeah, now we would, um, oh, sorry, what happened here? Ah, yeah, if you, um, look at the literature now, you can see that um, citations dealing with mechanochemistry incre increase, but there are also other terms around like tripology or ball milling and also tribochemistry, which is referred to the uh, interaction in solids. So nevertheless, there is a tremendous increase in the field and there are reasons for it. If you look at the definition that exists at the moment, UPAC um, defined mechanochemistry as chemical reactions, or a chemical reaction that is introduced by the direct absorption of mechanical energy. So this is a very broad uh, definition and also there are some things that are unclear. How can you measure the direct absorption for uh, example and so on. But nevertheless, it's a first impression. And here on the right, you can see what can actually do when we um, introduce uh, transformation using mechanical energy. We have pressure and shear and the combination of these are working together and we can then obtain fresh surfaces. Of course, we can abrase material. We also encounter amorphization and of course, phase transformation. Throughout milling, uh, defects get accumulated in the solids, and then we can see really changes on the near and the long range order. What made mechanochemistry especially famous in the last, let's say, 15 to 20 years is the green chemistry aspect. So it's really a green method. It can live without any solvent or only catalytical amounts of solvent, and that makes it very interesting also, especially now for chemistry. Yeah, sorry for <laughs> industrial chemistry. Um, UPAC came up with this definition, but also with another text in 2019, naming mechanochemistry as one of the 10 chemistry innovation that will really change the world. And in this short text, two important aspects are named. The first thing is that through mechanochemical reaction, we can um, make processes possible that cannot be obtained or, or material, we can generate material that cannot be obtained by any other 
known traditional, for instance, solution synthesis. And the second aspect is maybe interesting for scientists. We are still struggling to understand what is actually happening here on a molecular scale. So if we um, think about different um, milling conditions or the, the mechanochemical reactions um, that are typically performed in lab scale, we rely on these different types of mill. Some of them need um, uh, balls during the milling process, and then it's usually referred to ball milling. But we are also aware of different other techniques like jet mills or extruders or resonance acoustic mixing that can work um, ball free and also offer a possibility, for instance, to scale up um, the processes. So these different mills and also the different milling conditions that are possible make mechanochemistry such an interesting field to explore, but also so difficult to understand what's really going on. You can see here in this little sketch, there are different parameters that influence our process under study, the temperature of the mill, the material of the jars, and also the ball material, something like the number to ball ratio and uh, milling frequency, of course, but also many other things. You can see here that also liquids can be added to the um, mechanochemical reaction, and this has a further implication, and it's really of great interest in co-crystallization, in mechanochemical co-crystallization. As you might know from the literature, this eta value was created to differentiate between knead grinding on the one side, where we have really no solvent present, and then moving on to this liquid assisted grinding, where we have small catalytic amounts of solvents, and then we move on to slurry, slurries, and then we are really in solution. If you're new to the field and interesting, interested in starting it, I would refer to you to this um, publication by uh, my colleague Anna Vilengua. So it's a video journal. You can also see how you can really perform this reaction. And she also gave a perfect protocol on how to approach those. With these different milling conditions, sometimes there comes the problem that we are not understanding one another, or we cannot relate results from one group to the other group. And in the context of this, we came up with the idea to come up with a little symbolism you can see here, where each and every mechanochemical reaction can be described very easily. And you can see at a glance what is really going on and um, which parameters were chosen for the reaction. You can see here in the middle, we have the primary mechanochemical action, and you can see additives that were added, either solids or any liquids or also polymer. Polymers can be added to the reaction, the temperature and also milling frequency and time. And then it makes it really easy to differentiate between different um, milling conditions. Here on the right side is shown that this formalism can be applied to many reactions. You see alloying reactions here on top, but also metal oxides and nitrides. Uh, can be easily described and the reactions from metallorganic um, compounds and, of course, as you can see here, a co-crystallization. In this case, um, performed by resonant acoustic mixing. So the history of mechanochemistry and co-crystallization is also very rich. If we have a short look on the first publication here by Ling and Baker, who showed that uh, co-crystallization is uh, possible. It is a quinone that is formed here just by manual grinding. And then in the following, Rastogi and Singh showed that planar molecules could easily act, uh, react together just by bringing them in contact um, at a surface. And um, Roger Davy and colleagues showed that some co-crystallizations co um, need uh, the formation of a eutectic in between. You see here the reaction of benzophenone and diphenylamine. It's on a watch glass, and if you just mix it with a spatula, you see here this yellow liquid that's a eutectic form. And later on, if you stir it a bit more, then you see really crystallization and you get your co crystal. So, and also um, there were reports that amorphous phases. Um, 
are, let's say, are observed from the reactants to the copper source. Later on, Bill Jones was the first to show that this liquid assisted grinding approach is maybe a way to influence reaction kinetics. And later on, he would also show that you can influence the type of products you achieve um, during milling. And this all is nicely summed up, of course, in a review which appeared in Crystal Crows and Design. That's maybe one of the highly cited articles here. Okay, let's um, move into details or uh, not without showing you that all these reactions, of course, can be um, explained by this symbolism I showed before. So in a recent publication here, we studied um, the co-crystallization of carbamazepine with different um, hydro um, benzoic acids. And the, we use these different acids as uh, co-formers. You can see here again, the milling condition, it's a normal um, ball mill and we milled the reactants for um, 30 minutes. And the outcome was three new structures not known before. We solved the crystal structures from powder diffraction data. That is also something that um, is increasingly done in the last years. And it's possible to do also developments um, on the side of so uh, software that we can really solve structures from uh, the powder data. So you see the different um, uh, the, the diffraction data here. And here you can see the crystal structures. So in the first um, example, this is the two to four um, co-former. We can see um, that the um, homosynthons existing in the starting materials, uh, carbamazepine and the acid are preserved. It changes a bit if we move on to this two five compound, then we see new heterosynthons formed here marked with um, orange and blue. And we also have some pi pi stacking. The result is a more wave-like structure, as you can see here below. And in the last case, we change from our homosynthons to a new strong heterosynthon, which is also uh, well known. So we were now interesting to learn a bit more about the kinetic profile of these reaction, and therefore we performed um, experiments for a certain amount of time, stopped the experiment, and then did Riedfeld refinement to check for the phase composition. And this, these data um, are shown here. And you can see um, that the co-crystal between carbamazepine and the 2,4 compound and the carbamazepine and the 2,6 compound, they so, show very, let's say, a similar profile, whereas in the other case, here the 2,5 compound there is a different uh, profile. And we tried to find a reason for that. And um, here we hypothesized that the rate of co-crystal formation is correlated with the packing structure in the final product. As I said, here in, in the case of uh, the two to four uh, compound, we preserve the um, homocenton of the reactants. And here in the two to six compound, we have a strong new heterosynthon, and these two are much faster as compared to the other structure with a um, not so strong uh, synthons formed. We also looked at the size of the crystallites in this case, which is usually reduced in the first stage of milling due to uh, comminution. So we have usually um, smaller particles, but here you can see for the two to four and also for the two to uh, to six compound, the formation of the co-crystal starts right after onset of, of milling. So within the first 10 seconds, we already see reflections of the final product. So in this, these cases, um, it, uh, the comminution is not a prerequisite for the reaction. It starts immediately, whereas in the other case, we can see that there is a short delay and it takes some time before the, the co-crystal is formed. These are reactions we can follow ex situ. And there's another example uh, of reactions you can easily perform in um, ex situ studies. And these are competition reactions. So if you're interested whether a co-crystal will be formed under these conditions, 
or also which cocosol might be more stable within a series. These are easy reactions to be carried out and you can learn a lot about the stability of your compound. You can he here see a series of experiments we performed with theophylline and different co-farmers. And basically we performed two types of reaction. The first question was in the presence of two co-farmers, which um, API co-former pair will be formed more easily. And also the second question was then once um, a co-crystal is formed and we challenge this co-crystal with another co-former, will we have a change in our product? And here I, I won't show data, I just show the outcome of this experiment. You can see that here in if we, if at any point we have benzoic acid and isonocotinamid together, then they would form a co-crystal and they won't care about um, theophylline. In the acid cases, we could see that the co-crystal formed between um, theophylline and nicotinic acid is the more stable one, and that is preferred um, as compared to the two other possibilities. So this was an older study, but also in a in a recent study, we compared the situation um, for uh, here pyrazinamide. We also used uh, pyrazinamide with um, different um, other molecules, very similar molecules, so that there will no, not be any um, steric um, issues. And you can see here isoniazide, which is especially of interest because this compound is very similar to pyrazinamide, and we were wondering whether we can get a tannery co-crystal with those two. And we used as co-crystals in this case, uh, uh, co-formers in this case, we had different decarboxylic acid. And again, the same type of reactions. So we were looking for either one-to-one -one or, or um, two-to-one co-crystals, and we would challenge them. Uh, so we would um, react all three compounds, or we would challenge an existing co-crystal with another one. And here you see um, what happened. So in, um, in these cases, we were able to form a co-crystal, but we would not be able to form a co-crystal with pyrazinamide and isoniazide. It would always win in these reactions. And it was also not possible to form the two to one compound. So in all cases, the combination of isoniazide and the co-formers is more stable. And that can be explained by a, a, a decrease in basicity. So it follows Atom's rules. And then we have here um, a decrease in the stability. Okay, still, so we, are, we have been ex situ. Now we turn to the in situ investigations. You can see here a normal uh, reaction. We have two um, reactants, A and B and different powders, and we end up with a product C, and we can either do that in a motor or in, an, uh, in a ball mill. But nevertheless, it's a black box reaction. So we don't know what is really happening here. And there are a lot of questions related to this reactions. Do we know the exact milling condition? What is the active species? And when are the products formed, for instance? But these questions need to be answered if we really want to control the process. And if you think about um, our studies, um, in situ studies, so from the data, we want to have information about the mechanism, learn a bit about the kinetics in order to control the processes, and then, of course, reproduce reactions and have the possibility to scale up the processes. And for that, um, it is important that we investigate um, these reactions in a time resolved manner. Just a quick Look on history, ex situ experiments have been always carried out. It's a great um, method as well. So you can use all the methods you have in the lab to analyze your products. And you can see here that indirect time resolved investigations have been um, reported in the literature. It's mostly um, pressure and uh, temperature recordings. But here in 2013, it started with the pioneering work of, of Fistridge and colleagues. You see their setup up here, where they moved the mill to the synchrotron 
and measured um, synchrotron X-ray refractions. So there are improvements to this setup. Here are the colleagues from the PSI. They have a ball mill with an outer ring where the sampling happens. So you get high quality data um, for these investigations. A little drawback is that you cannot really monitor um, reactions where you use tiny amounts of liquids. And that is a recent um, update we did, and I will um, come to that in a second. Okay, and this is our in situ system and our setup we use. You can see we have had this Easter egg in the beginning. We made a bit of an improvement when it comes to the reactor. And so this has to be transparent so that we can shine our Raman laser in. So we know something about what's happening on a molecular level. We also use thermography to get an information about what's happening temperature wise. And we use, of course, X-ray diffraction for long range order. This is how, uh, yeah, no, I cannot show this because I have a pointer. You see, so this is the video. You can see this is a mill in action. You cannot hear the sound. So we get kicked, kicked out of laboratory space repeatedly because it's too noisy for others. And here you can see the setup in its full beauty at the synchrotron. It's usually a messy thing. And that's why we usually show sketches, but just that you have an impression. So it gets cluttered. Okay. So um, now let's move on to an, an example. Here again, it's a co-crystallization, coffee in and anthranolic acid. It's a system that has been studied by many colleagues and we have two forms. And we also know two polymorphic forms. And we know that um, these forms can be, um, uh, the outcome of a mechanochemical reaction can be um, targeted specifically if we use specific uh, solvents. Usually we end up with this um, thermodynamic stable form one with all the solvents, but if you use acetonitrile or acetone, we get this other form. And if you look at the hydrogen bonding pattern, it's the same thing in both structures. We have these chains, but um, so here is a slight twist in the structure and we uh, hypothesize that there is an interaction between the solvent, even if it's tiny amount and this chain, and then we get um, a change in the local geometry and later on also, which leads to the crystallization of a different structure. We also were interested if we only need really tiny amounts of material. And here you see ex situ data for one gram of reactants and 25 microliters of acetonitrile. And you can see that the reaction really moves on very fast after 120 seconds. So always stopping the reaction and then measuring the product, we cannot see any traces of the reactants. And this is more or less the same reaction done in an in, in situ setup. And you can see what we measured here ex situ. Luckily, it's the same thing we also observed under in situ conditions. It's a fast um, transformation. That can be the case, but not all the time. And I will show you uh, some examples. OK, so here in this sketch, we um, recently published a review article on in situ investigations of mechanochemical reactions. And we brought together all the information that is now available and all the different met methods that we use um, analyzing mechanochemical reactions. And you can see here, typically, if you look at these kinds of re reactions, we have three types of periods, an induction period, as I said, comminution. So we have these defects built in, then we have um, the bulk mixing situation, then we get the molecular mixing here in the reactant period, nucleation cross sets in, and we have a product period. And here in this area is where the cool things happen and where we want to learn more about um, the mechanisms. And you can see the different methods that are nowadays used, also NMR is among those, so it's really pushing the field forward. And here's an example. Again, you see it's a co-crystallization, a two-to-one co-crystal. In this case, it's theobromine and oxalic acid. We see a normal uh, um, reaction pattern. We have this induction period. We have a reaction period and the product stage. And luckily, if you combine different methods, which we have done with uh, Raman spectroscopy shown here and also thermography, then you can really see the process both on the changes in the local um, molecular um, ordering, 
as well as in the crystallite size, and you get information about the temperature. Here you can see the temperature of the reactant mixture in black, and in gray we have the temperature of the final product milled under the same condition. You can see there is not much change. So only here is a drop, a slight drop, which is due to the release of water, that is uh, dihydrooxalic um, acid, and after the reaction here, it's released. Raman tells the same story. We can see it here a bit in this uh, pronounced shift, that's the CC and um, CN um, stretching in, in the imidazole ring that's changed during the reaction. So we can pin down that really um, both methods show exactly the same period of uh, uh, reaction period. Okay, this was an example where we knew what's happened and this is another um, molecule we studied intensively. It's pyrazinamide, it's an anti-tuberculosis drug and we reacted it with malonic acid and we ended up with this co-crystal which was already known and afterwards we performed different liquid acetyl grinding experiments looking for uh, new polymorphs of this compound. We never found any, but then we investigated the process in situ and here you see a slightly different picture. So we have more stages in between and here this, oh, sorry, this red area, you can see here is a tiny uh, reflection coming up that we don't see in the final compound. This is actually another polymorph of this co-crystal. And you can see that it only persists for two minutes in its pure form and also under liquid assisted grinding condition here with ethanol, it persists for two minutes. So what we could do then is like stop the reaction, um, prepare a sample, measure it and then um, solve the crystal structure from the powder pattern. What we can see here is a general trend that usually under liquid assisted grinding conditions, the reaction is faster. So this is the, the resulting crystal structure. You can see here we have uh, a chain structure for polymorph one and for this new polymorph, we have a tetramere consisting also of a homocenton here. Okay, we played around a little, little bit more with pyrazinamide and here you see the co-crystallization with um, pimelic acid. Again, two polymorph forms. And interestingly, you can get form two under neat grinding conditions or with unpolar solvents. That is something we also observe quite often in this field. And you get this polar form, uh, this form one when you use polar solvents. Again, we have similar hydrogen bonding pattern. We know from DFT, calcula DFT calculations and also from slurry experiments that form one is the thermodynamically stable form. You see the crystal structures here. And also if we look at DTA, DG, you can see they have pretty much um, the same um, melting point. My PhD student then did some testing after uh, a few months and to check whether we still have this form two present in our samples. And he observed something interesting. You see here data for material that was um, uh, synthesized using 50 Hertz and 20 minutes of milling. After uh, 22 days, we can see here that form two starts to transform in form one. So we get a, a change from the more stable, uh, from the less stable polymorph towards the more stable polymorph here and um, the, the amount increases. We did some um, tests changing the frequency and also um, the size of the milling balls used. And here you can see an interesting um, effect. This is the example, um, sorry, this is the example I just showed. If we increase the, uh, if we decrease the frequency shown here, and if we decrease the ball size, this is a nine millimeter ball in the end, then we really have um, lesser um, time uh, stable this uh, polymorph too. So the impact the sample sees during the synthesis has, um, it has a decisive effect on the longevity of the sample. We did again 
um, some in situ experiments because we were wondering whether seeds of the more stable form appear at some um, time in the reaction. But you can see here it's not the case. So it directly goes to the pure form one in case of meat grinding or polar unpolar solvent, and it goes to directly to form one in case of a polar solvent. So from these um, um, example, we can learn that obviously different protocols um, not affect not only which polymorph you have in the end, so the polymorphic outcome, but can also have an influence on the longevity of, of the product we formed under mechanochemical conditions. And that is, this is an aspect that is not studied intensively in, enough and there are ongoing um, studies in this field. We can also make ternary core crystals, as I just showed before in our competition reactions. You can see here a ternary core crystal consisting of pyrazinamide, isonicotinamide, and clotaric acid. And we knew from lab experiments that it's possible to form first the binary core crystal and then add a third component and have the tannery core crystal. We were wondering whether the third way is also possible, so directly mill together all three and see how this reaction um, performs, so which intermediates can be formed during the reaction. I bring up the milling condition picture here again, because in this case we were looking at the milling frequency and the influence of the milling frequency on the reaction. So here you see again our top view of um, X-ray diffraction data, and we see the starting materials, final product. And here in green you see in between we have a formation of a binary core crystal. In this case, it's not really good to distinguish between uh, the formation of the binary and the ternary phase in Raman spectroscopy. We only see a pronounced change when we look at the pyrazinamide molecule. Um, uh, whether um, it is in the co-crystal form or not. So this is CH stretching that changes unless it's the, the bending vibration of the ring. So these data are shown for 40 hertz milling time, but if we increase uh, the frequency, and you can see here, then we have a change in the mechanism. So we don't observe the formation of binary compounds, it directly reacts to form the ternary compound. The reaction itself is six times faster compared to this reaction on the lower frequency, and also the induction period is only a third of the one we would observe under 40 hertz. So, and we rationalized that we, sorry, that we see um, the binary um, compound in in this case, before because we have lower mechanical impact and also lower mixing intensity, and therefore it's harder for three components to meet to form the ternary uh, co-crystal, and the binary phase is um, here preferred in this case. Okay, I have to look at the time. I try to speed up a bit. So um, this is um, a system we have intensively studied. I will not go into super great detail, it's theophylline benzamide. And this compound has again two polymorphs. And as we know already, we have um, a different way of formation if we uh, perform the reaction under meat grinding conditions, or if we use um, polar solvents in comparison, then we end up here with form one of the polymorph, or in the other cases, we have form two. We performed um, further tests, slurry experiments, and so on. And it's clear now that if we use um, meat grinding and non-polar solvent, we end up with a kinetically controlled product. And in the other case, we see in between the formation of this compound and then end up with a stable, a thermodynamically stable form. I uh, show you see these data to highlight um, our new um, or the changes we did to the in situ measurements with our new setup, we improved the jar uh, geometry. So that is a jar that has a really thin wall now that we have no uh, not so much contribution of the perspex material. And also we did changes 
to the measurement strategy. Just briefly, if you perform a normal X-ray diffraction experiment, your sample is at a fixed point. And now you have seen how this um, um, draw wobbles around. So we usually get overlays of different positions um, where information gets scattered. And if you choose the position where we measure very wisely, we end up with high quality data that can really now um, be used for um, read felt refinement. And we also get more information on um, microstructural parameters. Coming back to the example I just showed uh, before, you can see here again the reaction of theophylline and benzamide. You can see now we can really go down to um, tiny amounts of sample, which is also important in other cases where we just don't have enough sample to perform a reaction. And you see here the reaction under neat grinding condition, as we would expect, we end up with this um, at uh, form one in this case. And you can see here also that we end up with a um, particle size of around 100 nanometers. If you perform the same reaction under liquid assisted grinding conditions using uh, water in this case, we see a, a different behavior. Here you see in this uh, violet color, in between we have the formation of the theophylline hydrate before we really produce the final form two here. So now with this high quality data, we are able to see these slight changes we haven't seen in the, in the older experiment. And obviously, it is important that this hydrate is formed first. You see now here the intensity diminishes. And in between, afterwards, we have the formation of form two, which ends up at a higher uh, crystallite size, around about 300 nanometers. And these data compare very well to um, measurements. Anna Belengua and Aurora uh, Cruz Cabeza have been performed a few years ago, where they could show that really the size of the crystallite defines which polymorph is formed in the end. Okay, let me give a quick outlook. What are the future steps? You can see here um, what is done at the moment in terms of um, time resolved in situ analysis. So these methods have been established, Raman spectroscopy, X-ray diffraction, but also if we come to um, metals, Exercising SANES experiments have been established, NMR, even in, in the um, instrument, you can have little mills and perform your re re reaction. And of course, um, uh, pressure was monitored and temperature during the reaction. It would help a lot if other methods like uh, total scattering and also small angle X-ray scattering would be available, but also time domain um, spectroscopy or infrared spectroscopy. We believe that if we are able to perform these reactions under um, realistic condition, and also if you combine different methods to counterbalance, um, let's say the lags each method had, have, has, then we can finally uh, really control these um, co-crystallizations. Okay, let me come to my final comments. Um, yeah, I'm really, Thankful for Crystal Growth and Design. Uh, it's a it's a really great journal. So if I'm if I have time and I just want to flip through an issue, Crystal Growth and Design is really the go-to journal. So they are really always interesting articles, and somehow you know that it's that is going to be solid science. So it's a uh, really high quality journal. And um, yeah, thanks again for um, yeah giving me this, uh, letting me give this webinar. And um, for the co-crystallization, I, I hope I could show you that we really encounter an entanglement of different mechanism and that we are still, let's say, only seeing the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding what's really uh, going on here. So many factors influence um, uh, the rates and the, the solid state reactions are really complex and also complex to, to investigate. So hopefully for the future, um, different or new time-resolved methods will develop and also 
the, the protocols when it comes to production of the, um, the core crystals, but also when it comes to um, measurement and, and sampling procedures that will help us a lot to understand what's really going on in this um, black box. Yeah, with my final slide, I would like to thank a bunch of great colleagues and collaborators from yeah, nearly all over the world. So um, here you see our last outing as a group. That is Christmas party 2019. And then this other thing happened. But you can see we made an effort. So um, we are not dancers, but we tried line dancing at least. OK, and with this, I would yeah, like to thank you. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Francisco, thank you. Wow. Um, the insight into what's actually going on during the course of the reaction that I hadn't realized that, that you were able to get such detailed insight. That's, that's really humbling. Uh, the chat's going crazy with lots of people saying thank you for those insights as well. Um, we've already got a few questions coming up. Uh, just a reminder, pop your questions in the Q&A, please. I see a couple in, in the chat and maybe move them across if, uh, if they're burning ones. Um, let's start off with, with a very early question that came in just the beginning of the talk from uh, P. Yaswant. Um, who could, wanted a bit of an overview as to how mechanochemistry is useful, specifically in the context of, of uh, drug polymorphism. I know you've alluded to that a little bit along the way through, but, but maybe you'd care to share your thoughts in that context. Um, can, you, can you repeat? I didn't get the beginning of your question here. Sorry. It, it's um, how can I, mechanochemistry... No. It, yeah, the first one, how mechanochemistry is useful in, in solid state drug polymorphism. Yeah, let's see. Um, so um, I think this field is really ex ex exploding. So um, I, I showed with my um, with the, the reactions where we challenged um, different co-crystal formers. It is a super easy screening method also. You know, within like 10, 15 minutes, you can perform a bunch of reactions. And, and you directly have, um, yeah, if, if you use X-ray diffractions, for instance, you directly have uh, the information about, um, let's say, different polymorphs or outcome of, of the reaction. And also, we have examples in the field where we really only can um, synthesize a, a certain compound under these conditions. You cannot um, achieve it in, in a normal uh, solution uh, chemistry approach, then you usually would crystallize either or the other compound, but never, for instance, uh, the co-crystal. So that is a big plus. And of course, that I mentioned, it's, it's, it's green in that sense that you don't really need a lot of solvent. Yeah, tremendous uh, applications there. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just skip ahead um, to, to the next question. Uh, Kanishka Sikliga has asked, um, what was your opinion on the, the single greatest advantage and disadvantage of a mechanochemical reaction? Um, yeah, let's say, um, so the, the greatest advantage is maybe, um, it's, it's maybe this the the time you need and and the ease of the reaction so you need not much you really don't need much you can do it with a mortar and pestle so we have colleagues uh, in the field who really still stand in the lab and and um, do their reaction in this way this is a, really a plus the drawback is so i showed in situ data but these data um, are usually um, generated at a synchrotron so you cannot do it all the time. So of course, Raman probes, for instance, are available in, in different labs and people have shown uh, tremendous work using um, Raman probes in the lab. But to get a proper insight, you will always rely on also in situ data and then you would rely on, on, on synchrotron beam time. Yeah, and particularly the way that that in situ data is, is showing up the formation of intermediates like the dihydrate um, before Get the final product is it's amazing. Mm. You just miss that completely if you were looking at the endpoint. Yeah. Also, if you if you let's say if you stick to the ex situ regime, so you also um, have to keep in mind that your sample that you measure maybe then two hours later is not the one that has left the jar. So there are changes in between, and and we have seen uh, reports where people just kept on measuring that transformations once induced would go on even 
without any um, impact being present anymore. The ubiquitous Travis Holman question. Hi, Travis. Um, great talk. Uh, I'm quite curious how one accurately measures particle size by powder diffraction in the face of peak broadening due to sample thickness, position, etc. Yeah. So of course, um, uh, these measurements have been. Uh, so, so what you what we did in in these cases, the basis is a Wittfeld refinement, and of course, then we have the information from peak broadening also uh, compared to, to standard material measured and so on. And then you can um, reliably determine uh, the, uh, the crystallite size of your um, compound. And that's kind of related to a question that came up in the chat about generally determining structure from powder diffraction. I, I was just amazed at the quality of the diffraction patterns that, that you're getting. Um, you mentioned coemission. Uh, Clearly, there's some kind of significant recrystallization process to give you give you nicely crystalline materials that you can use on in Rietveld refinement. So, um, for for the Rietveld refinement, when we saw the powder diffraction data, uh, when we saw, saw the crystal structure from powder diffraction data, we use the as synthesized um, material. So there is not a recrystallization step in between. But mm -hmm. if you if you um, look, uh, if you uh, um, think about the diffraction pattern I showed for the in situ data, um, also at the end, um, so the the crystallite size is, let's say, in a typical um, co-crystallization um, experiment uh, between 100 and 200 nanometers, which is not that bad, also for a, um, for a structure de determination. And, and usually we do it also with our in-house instruments. So these are not synchrotron data. It's just like a, it's a, let's say, specialized instrument in that term that it's a capillary instrument, but you can still, um, yeah, perform normal measurements and, and solve the structure. Great. Okay. Uh, Kiao Li has asked, um, it said, I was also doing some sort of competitive co-crystallization through liquid assisted grinding. But in practice, even if the time is long enough, the samples may still appear to be not fully reacted occasionally. Yeah. Would it be helpful to change the milling types or add more milling balls? How to get the reaction to go to completion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, if, you, if you think about this, um, the curve I showed, so you basically maybe you're in, in the middle in, of your reaction and you have not milled long enough or the impact is not sufficient. So either increase um, uh, the frequency or, or ball size would be an idea. It, just because it, maybe I didn't mention it, but for these competition reaction, we would not use any solvents at all because as I showed, the, their influence is another gain. So um, just to be on the safe side, these were neat um, grinding reactions. Uh, and Andy Quashi has asked her, and I think I know the answer to this already, how you solve structures from powder x-ray data. That, that's a huge question, but maybe you can recommend a good uh, literature source or something Wait. that he could read up on, he or she can read up on. Uh, if, I, if I'm fast enough, I can even show the book. There is a, a great book by a German colleague and it's usually followed by my, I cannot show it. <laughs> <laughs> it's from Robert Dinnebeer. It's a, okay. um, He's a, um, a solid state chemist and, and he's really um, a wizard when it comes to structure solution. And he wrote a book, I, I think together with Simon Billinge um, on, on um, structure solution also from, from powder diffraction data. It's, it's not an, let's say it's not a super easy task, but uh, um, let's say also software has improved tremendously. So just to mention a few, there's Dash out there that is linked to, to the CCDC. And there's um, Expo, which from Italian colleagues, which is um, I highly recommend when you go to uh, metal organic frameworks and there are other programs. So it, in some cases you can also use your normal um, single crystal um, programs to solve the crystal structure. Just treat uh, the powder diffraction data set as a super bad single crystal data set. Right. Yeah, fantastically powerful technique. Well worth reading up on, Andy. Okay, um, we still have a few minutes left, which is great. Um, Nadim Javid asks, um, can you explain what information will be achieved using in situ SACs in a ball mill co-crystallization? 
Yeah. So, okay. Um, for what we would know from, maybe it's not the, the best technique for, or, or not the, the uh, a technique that is really needed for co-crystallization. But for instance, we did um, some experiments where we in, were interested in nanoparticle formation under mechanochemical conditions. And, and therefore, for instance, it would be a really a good add-on to, to see um, the particle sizes early in the formation. That is something that you cannot capture with a X-ray diffraction. You see then really existing crystals, but not um, the smaller sizes um, for comparison. If that's a, in the field of um, co-crystallization, it would, might only help um, if, we, if we look at, at um, no, it actually, it might be only helpful if we look at super small particles formed at the beginning. And I've just seen the slide that's up there, actually, if people are interested in learning about how to solve structures and powder diffraction data, then it looks like the Eighth European Crystallography School is what you need to go to. Yeah, and also other aspects, but um, I was asked to, to put this up. And I um, so it, it is, uh, I think it's a, it's a great uh, possibility to either, if, you, if you're not familiar with synchrotron facilities, visit them for the first time, but also get information what you can do really um, when it comes to crystallography using uh, synchrotron radiation. So a lot of experts are there. And of course, I have to mention it, Berlin is also a fun place to go besides science. So it's <laughs> worth well, right, well, we're on it. I'll put in a plug for that. There's also a, a Durham School for Powder Diffraction run by uh, John and Evener Evans as well, which um, it's every, it runs every two years, which is specifically focused on that topic. So there's lots of resources out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. an anonymous question, um, which is, is, I guess is, is relevant. Uh, how confident are you in determining the co-crystal structure using powder patterns without single crystals? In other words, yeah, how sure are you that you haven't got, I suppose, a false minimum or something like that? Yeah. So usually we have um, also some DFT calculations to, to make sure that we are not totally uh, wrong. And um, this is maybe the, the most important aspect. And usually would also combine other techniques, for instance, to make sure if you, if you think about hydrates and so on, so you have your thermal analysis and we have solid state NMR to make sure whether it's a, in, in case of core crystals, whether we have a salt or a really um, neutral molecules and so on. So additional information from, from other um, methods can also help in this case. Yeah, I can imagine that it's well a very reliable technique at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, Ricardo Castro asks um, a great presentation. Uh, your experiences are in, in air atmosphere. Have you tried other atmospheres like a nitrogen atmosphere, for example? Is that relevant? Yeah, we have um, tried that, but also let's say, honestly, there were, it, it was not too much we did in, in this uh, field. Usually we, we used um, um, nitrogen to, to avoid um, humidity in the first place. So some read, so there's also a great article by uh, my colleague um, Elena Boldi River asking the question, how dry is really a dry co-crystallization? Because you know what you, what you take from the shelf might not be the driest compound on earth. So in this regard, let's say we have tried um, using different atmospheres, namely nitrogen, but we didn't go uh, very deep into this. So pioneers in, in the field, uh, Kaup, for instance, so if you uh, look up his articles, he has done a lot of synthesis and uh, also different gaseous environments. I suppose that might be relevant to the kind of organometallic chemists or something yeah. like that, or people making yeah. hydride materials, the hydrogen storage or something like that. Uh, whole other area. Yeah, also lovely work on, on perovskites now, you know, with those um, halide perovskites. Uh -huh. Therefore, for instance, then we also use, um, yeah, different environments just to avoid humidity. Right, right. Okay, and uh, uh, there's a final anonymous question. What's the difference between the planetary grinding and, sh and a shaking grinding uh, for co-crystal formation? It is the impact. So um, if, you, if you look in the literature, uh, most, um, articles where they were alloying or also um, formation of oxides, where people are focusing on that, they would 
use a planetary ball mills. Um, and uh, in, in what we do, it's more what I would call, let's say, soft materials. So it's organometallics or organic uh, molecules. Then we usually would go to um, these types of mills, the, the shaker mills, so the impact is not uh, that intense. So otherwise, in, in some cases, not in all, you end up with amorphization of your compounds. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, well, well, that's perfect, Francisca. That takes us exactly to uh, to four o'clock your time. I'm and, happy, uh, you're happy. Gosh. <laughs> and my, my Alexa in the background is taking part as well, so I think that's the cue to, to finish. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you ever so much for an absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, there's loads and loads of people saying thank you in the chat, loads of questions, um, uh, and around 140 people have really enjoyed the experience. And I, I must admit, my eyes have been opened, uh, and, and I thought I'd been following this field, but uh, clearly not closely enough. And thank you for the kind comments on crystal growth and design. But, <laughs> explicitly yes. trying to flog it, but uh, <laughs> it always helps. <laughs> Great. Um, well, everybody, don't don't forget um, to sign up for Susan Rock's Leedens, um, uh, which will be, I guess, more single crystal focused um, next month. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks a lot, everyone, for coming. It's been another great webinar, and thank you so much, Francisca, in particular. It's been fantastic. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having thanks me. Thank you.